quantum physics soon. Ooh, I forgot. Uh... Microphone, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be back to ICTP. And um, so um, let me see if I. So yeah. So I, I want to tell you about this machine learning perspective uh, and what I mean by that. And uh, um, so I was at uh, D-Way for a while and Perimeter, but now I moved on to uh, this place called Vector Institute. So this is since uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so let me tell you what this place is. So it's, a, um, it's, a, it's an independent, non-for-profit uh, collaboration between the universities, the government, and businesses uh, to develop AI, right? And um, so these are vector faculty, most notably Geoffrey Hinton and Rich uh, Semel, my, my boss, basically. And um, uh, so I, I take care of like the quantum physics aspect of uh, AI. and. Uh, um, and so part of what I'm going to tell you today is uh, uh, about that, uh, like what's my perspective or like my uh, take on uh, what's, what are the implications of uh, quantum physics in, in uh, AI and uh, what can AI do for us in physics. And these are my machine learning physics uh, friends, or let me read their names, so Roger Melko, Giacomo Torlai. Uh, Peter, uh, Simon Trebst, Essen, Kelvin, uh, Giuseppe Carleo, uh, Matthias Troyer, and Guglielmo Mazzola, who is here in the audience. Uh, and so let me uh, be pretty, um, let me just give you like a little introduction uh, using a very informal uh, description of the complexity uh, of the many body problem in classical and quantum physics. Um, so, um, so one of the I think the first postulate, postulate of quantum mechanics is that uh, a generic uh, specification of a quantum state requires resources that uh, grow exponentially uh, in the number of degrees of freedom. Like, uh, for instance, if you want to write down the wave function for a spin system, a spin one-half system, you need, in, in general, two to the n coefficients. So that's, uh, that's a lot. And um, uh, so... Um, as we know, and this audience doesn't need a reminder what the exponential growth means, but like, just, let me just tell you that uh, today's, uh, today's best supercomputers can solve the wave equation, Schrodinger equation exactly for only a, a few uh, particles, like 45, and for that you need big, big computers. Um, and just uh, as to emphasize like, how uh, tough these problems that we deal with are is, just telling you that uh, <clears throat> for storing the wave function of a 273 spin one half system, you require computers with more bits than there are atoms in the universe. But um, we, we're interested in problems that are even bigger, as, as we all know, and they're relevant in chemistry, in condensed matter, and, and quantum computing, and they're way larger than 273 spins. Um, then we have uh, quantum computing, which may help us uh, solve uh, some of these problems, but uh, that's uh, still under development. We still have to figure that out. And so we still have to rely on uh, uh, classical algorithms, basically. And so uh, this is because nature is sometimes compassionate, even though nature may not care about what we think. Uh, but uh, many body systems can be uh, typically studied or characterized by an amount of information which is uh, smaller than this maximum capacity, right? Like this exponentially um, uh, big um, uh, systems. And uh, we do exploit that idea in like quantum Monte Carlo approaches where you do like a systematic uh, uh, sampling of the most important uh, 
regions of the Hilbert space. And uh, so that's how we are successful um, in applying these techniques because we, like this, this particular region of the Hilbert space where like things are more relevant and so on. And um, also because of the nature of uh, the entanglement properties of these many body systems, we can um, take a very generic wave function such as this one that I'm drawing here with diagrams and use, uh, for instance, matrix uh, product states and density matrix normalization group and still get an understanding of uh, many body systems, okay? Uh, and so that's um, part of like the techniques that we typically use, but um, I guess what I wanted to point out, which was already pointed out in the previous talk, is that uh, the machine learning community deals with uh, equally high dimensional uh, problems, right? That meaning like they, the problems that they deal with are exponentially big. And, uh, but they still uh, battle this curse of dimensionality pretty successfully and with impressive results in a wide spectrum of uh, scientific and technologically relevant research areas. And so that's kind of like what we thought and, and, and then it, Indeed, uh, quantum and classical many-body physics has not been the exception. There's lots of activity uh, going on right now, and uh, like in like phases of matter, um, um, way, uh, constructing wave functions out of these uh, techniques based, inspired by machine learning, acceleration of Monte Carlo, uh, and molecular dynamics, and quantum state preparation. There's a lot of activity. It's just almost impossible to list. Um, so, but um, let me just tell you like a little bit of uh, what I've done in this um, area. And so I'll discuss um, some of these applications of machine learning in, um, in many body physics. So one of them is like a supervised learning approach to uh, classical phase transitions and icing models. So that's kind of like the simplest thing that I started with. And then the, let me just try to briefly mention uh, two quantum systems, like two applications of these ideas to, uh, to, to two problems. And one of them is the interpretation of the wave function as a neural network, uh, where we write down the ground state of uh, the toric code using um, convolutional neural networks. Um, and then finally, very, very briefly, a uh, data intensive problem in quantum mechanics, which is that of the quantum state tomography, again, using neural networks, okay? So that's what I want to tell you today. So let me uh, go very fast, because time is uh, short. Um, sorry. Uh, so, uh, supervised learning of um, uh, uh, phases of matter, okay? And so, what do I mean by that? So, I'm going to introduce the idea using the simplest uh, problem, the Ising or Ising model. Um, and so, we all know, but let me remind you, th this is the Ising model. It's, it's a classical system of uh, variable sigma i that uh, take values plus or minus one, and they have, you have this energy function. And so, at low temperature, what happens is that uh, in order uh, for the system to minimize this energy, it just the spins basically polarize up or uh, down. Uh, but as the temperature increases, the system transitions from a uh, high temperature phase, a uh, low temperature phase, to a high temperature phase where the spins are disordered and they look random, okay, to a paramagnet. Um, so there's this uh, uh, ferromagnetic transition. Uh, it has this order parameter, which is basically the average over the, the uh, spins, which uh, is finite at low temperature and it transitions around 2.26 toward this. Uh, for a magnet, as uh, studied analytically, analytically by Owen Sager in the 40s. Okay, um, and so uh, so that's my system. So, but what do I mean by by machine learning and uh, supervised learning and so on in this context? Uh, and the the idea is that, uh, or the inspiration came from um, me trying to understand this um, fluctuations in handwritten digits. So then, machine learning the. Uh, they have this uh, it's a classic problem, which is that of uh, recognizing digits, handwritten digits by uh, high school kids. So they have this gigantic data set of uh, handwritten digits. And then what they propose or they do is, um, the, or the machine learning community developed this powerful techniques based on neural networks again, where you take uh, an image, which is uh, this like high dimensional uh, vector, um, um, that any camera in our phones could uh, take. And then this uh, uh, neural network recognizes this as a five, or a zero, or one, or two, and three. And then the 
when I was learning about this, I thought, oh, okay, this is a five, and which can be written as a, kind of like a perfect five, or mean field five, plus some fluctuations induced by the way we write, okay? And then that, that kind of like, I thought, oh, that looks like when we do a mean field calculation where we have a mean field cartoon of the phase, and then you add uh, thermal fluctuations or quantum fluctuations. And then I thought, oh, I could do the same in principle if I, uh, can take snapshots or images of these faces. And then, so that's exactly what I did. I took this technology that they developed for uh, recognizing digits and then uh, basically applied uh, to um, recognizing different uh, configurations at low temperature and high temperature. Okay, and then, uh, so basically, instead of uh, recognizing digits, I recognize, oh, that looks more like a ferromagnet, and this one looks more like a paramagnet. Okay, so it's pretty simple, but um, that's how I started uh, understanding machine learning. Um, and so what I did was I took the 2D IC model and I simply generated a big bunch of configurations drawn from the Boltzmann distribution. And at low temperature, 20K samples, at high temperature, 20K. Um, so here is like my data set plot uh, in a two-dimensional way. So at high temperature, you have a, this big blob of uh, configurations and um, at low temperature you have two uh, um, blobs that correspond to either spins mostly up or spins mostly down, okay? And in between there's some sort of phase transition um, and so that's my, uh, my machine learning setup. Um, and this is the, these are the results from, the, from this neural network that I train using this system. So you have two neurons, one uh, neuron I call the low temperature neuron, the other one I call the uh, high temperature one, and at low temperature there's the blue one that is very active, right? Like so it's near one. Um, but as I cross uh, from low temperature to high temperature, then the, the cold temperature deactivates while the um, uh, high temperature one activates, okay? And that, we observed, happens near the critical temperature, right? As you would expect, because uh, this is the point in which uh, you start uh, losing the magnetization and then like in this configuration becoming more and more random. And, and then so we did also a finite size uh, scaling uh, analysis of, the, of this, uh, the neural response, if you want, of this neural network. And then we even were able to um, uh, do a finite size collapse and even extract critical exponents, meaning that uh, this somehow this learning procedure preserves this universal properties of the phase transition, okay? And then uh, perhaps this was the surprising part uh, for us and um, was that, uh, so we did all the training uh, of, the, um, of the neural network on the square lattice, okay? So everything uh, more or less uh, pretty simple on the square lattice, but then what we did was to, okay, let's test if this thing is learning something meaningful. And so what we did was we ran simulations on the triangular lattice and then we tested um, this uh, configurations with this neural net that we trained, okay? And then uh, what we saw is that, um, so notice that uh, here is 2.2, roughly, the critical point, and then when we run this triangular uh, configurations through the trained neural net, we were able to pinpoint the critical uh, point of the triangular lattice, okay? So that was uh, interesting, and again, we were able to extract the critical exponent, and, um, and, but then we came up with an analytical understanding of what the neural net uh, did because typically people say, or some people tend to say that uh, they're pretty black boxy, but uh, we wanted to open it a little bit and we did and we found out that uh, what the neural net does is just to actually compute the magnetization as we would, right? Like, uh, and so we developed this uh, analytical model, very simple and so on. And, and then so that's why this going from the uh, square to the triangular works effectively, okay? And then we even tried changing dimensionality and still works, okay? So if you can, so I don't have the results here, but you can also run um, the three-dimensional icing model through the same uh, neural net and you still get the critical point of the, of the 3D, basically because all those transitions have the same order parameter, okay? So that was pretty, pretty neat, we thought. But then we thought, we, okay, so these are pretty easy uh, to recognize. You don't need a, an algorithm to tell you this is a ferromagnet or this is a paramagnet, right? Like you see, you recognize this by eye, basically, and you, so this is 
kind of like, uh, okay, it's interesting, but uh, can we do something more like non-trivial in some sense? And we ask, can we deal with uh, disorder and topological phases, which um, perhaps do not even have an order parameter? So, and uh, when you have this type of um, uh, phases, uh, they're harder to recognize. And they're important technologically, like uh, uh, fractional quantum Hall effect and quantum spin liquids, uh, gauge theories, and uh, they all have potential applications and so on. But also Coulomb phases, uh, they're highly correlated uh, spin liquids typically described by uh, electrodynamics, and even common water is, is one of them, and then spin ice materials. So we worked with those two examples. Today I'm going to tell you about this um, icing gauge theory, okay? So it's this uh, gauge theory from the 70s, uh, Wegener's uh, icing gauge theory. So it's uh, Hamiltonian that is very simple, it's classical. It's basically defined on the square lattice, but the spins live on the bonds of the, um, of the lattice and the Hamiltonian is just a product over the four spins on the plaquettes, okay? And then the interesting thing is that uh, the ground state at zero temperature, um, is no, there's no order, okay? And the spin-spin correlations decay exponentially fast. And so, as same way as they do at high temperature, at uh, infinite temperature, basically. So this is the phase diagram of the system. So there's a constrained, um, uh, ground state, classically disorder, and there's topological order as shown in this uh, paper by Claudio Chamon and uh, Claudio Castelnovo. Um, and then the, there's the high temperature phase, uh, which happens right uh, at any temperature, basically. So, but let me show you why this is difficult for machine learning and for our eyes. So, one of those two is ground, st uh, ground state uh, configuration, and the other one is high temperature. So, you want to guess, uh, maybe? Um, um, so it's a little bit harder, right? Like because there's no other parameter, which is what we see very easily. But in here, in both, in both configurations and both phases, the correlation functions decay uh, exponentially, so you can't tell as easily, right? So, so this one is the infinite temperature, and this is a ground state. Okay, five minutes. Okay. Um, so, um, um, okay. So. Um, so, and then we tried the same feed-forward neural network that uh, I was showing you uh, before, and we weren't able to, um, to train this uh, model successfully, so we, which leads to 50% accuracy, which is what you would do if you guessed, right? Like, because uh, it's only two phases, so if you start guessing, then sometimes you say, oh, this is ground state, and you're right, but half of the time you're wrong, okay? Um, so, but then we trained a convolutional neural network, which is, if includes more information, uh, more a priori information of the system. So now the neural net knows that you're in two dimensions and that there's locality, right? That uh, spin, like a sp one spin here is connected to the one on top and below and uh, on the right and on the left. So you, you're including a little bit more of like an inductive uh, bias. And then we're back uh, to uh, having a good accuracy. So we, we train. Um, so that, we, that was nice, but we also wanted to understand uh, what's going on analytically, and we were able to drive um, like a simplified version of the neural net that we um, that we train with our minds, right? Like so, we basically know. Oh, we figured out what the what this thing is doing. So we just simply uh, wrote it down analytically, and what it does is just comes and to each plaquette it checks the parity of the plaquette, meaning that it checks whether the product or the four spins is one, such that the energy is low, okay? So that's what the uh, um, trained neural net does, and this is what my analytical one does too, okay? And then, um, and then okay, so then we get 100% accuracy and so on. We were able to recognize these phases and, and it worked successfully. But let me move on, because I have only one minute now. The, to the la uh, so I'm go I, won I won't be able to discuss the whole thing, so I'm going to show you just one example of the quantum um, uh, mechanical systems, and it is the uh, Kitax quantum error correcting code with, uh, with this convolutional neural networks, which is basically taking this uh, uh, toy model or this analytical uh, neural net and realizing just realizing that that the cold neuron of this neural network is the ground state of the toric code.
Okay, so the toric code is basically uh, this uh, this Hamiltonian here, which is this um, Wegener Ising uh, gauge theory plus this term that induces quantum fluctuations defined over the vertices of the lattice. Okay, and then so when I was trying to understand this system, what I saw is that um, when the people using tensor networks write down ground state, they, they use this expression, okay? And that's exactly what I encoded um, when I was playing with this analytical model. So in the end, I ended up concluding that um, the ground state of the Tori code on top of uh, uh, being a PEPS or a tensor network written in this form, it can also be a neural network. So that was one of also of our results. and. Um, uh, and so that was kind of like the inspiration for, for us like to start using neural networks as ground states of uh, many body systems. And, but we were not alone. Then Giuseppe was also ahead, Giuseppe Carleo, who wrote a very nice paper and uh, many more. Okay? And so with that, let me conclude. I won't be able to uh, go through my second example, but uh, let me conclude. Uh, so we uh, encode and discriminate phases and phase transitions, uh, conventional and topological, uh, using machine learning technology or neural network technology, uh, and we understand those uh, analytically, which is nice. Um, we uh, wrote down some ground states uh, using uh, neural networks, and this is I didn't show, which is um, using actually uh, neural networks to do quantum state tomography. Um, I guess. I'd like to invite everybody, like, because I think there's potential for discovery using machine learning and using it for physical problems and so on. And, and with that, I conclude.